While training for the ASCA1 engine repair, I ran into three topics that seemed difficult at first. Number one is replacing a timing chain. Here we have an Audi S4 4.2 liter BBK engine. Timing chain replacement requires the engine to be out because the four timing chains are located on the back of the engine. Four chains on the back of the engine. Man, this engine is truly a work of art. Putting it back together, timing it, and reassembling the vehicle can be difficult for the average technician. Here's a more common engine, GM's 3.6 liter LLT engine, commonly found in GMC Acadia, Chevy Traverse, and a few others. This is also an engine out job. There's three chains and they require special tools and a specific sequence to time together. These are complicated engines. Even this is difficult for the average technician. The thing about these engines is that they're V-shaped. They have the camshafts overhead. So the cams are far from each other and they're far from the crankshaft. So you will need a really long chain or many chains to time them together. But what if the camshaft was really close to the crankshaft? Then you would only need a really small chain, right? This is essentially what camshaft and the block engines are like. My first timing job was on GM's 3800 Series 2 engine. This is what the timing mechanism looks like. The chain is real easy to replace, real easy to time. So at first, replacing the timing chain might seem difficult, but if the engine has the camshaft in the block, then it's not that bad. So, does the timing chain receive oil lubrication? Does the timing belt receive oil lubrication? Number two, checking main bearing oil clearance. During operation, the crankshaft's journals do not contact the bearings. There's very little clearance between the two, which is filled with pressurized oil. When building an engine, you have to measure this clearance to make sure it's within specification. You'll need expensive measuring tools to take very, very precise measurements. For an amateur, there's plenty of room for human error. Also, an amateur is gonna be dealing with issues such as, where exactly do I measure? How many measurements do I make? How tight should the micrometer be? How do I check my work? The process can take a very long time. But then I discovered that using plastic gauge is an accepted method of checking main bearing oil clearance. Plastic gauge has been proven to be accurate and it's as easy as tightening the caps to specification and removing them. So at first, checking main bearing oil clearance might seem difficult, but if you use plastic gauge, then even an amateur can do it. But yeah, eventually down the line, you're gonna wanna learn to use the measuring tools and use plastic gauge as a second opinion. So, what can happen if main bearing oil clearance is too low? What can happen if main bearing oil clearance is too high? Number three, removing and installing piston pins. When these are press fit, some technicians will just send the piston out to a machine shop and be done with it. But when you need to do it, you'll need a hydraulic press or a rod oven. This can be very dangerous for the beginner. Some people can burn themselves with that rod oven. It gets extremely hot and I've seen people work around it with no special gloves. I've also seen people take a blowtorch to the piston. <laughs> yeah, like that. That could work, but around here, we're not gonna be doing that. Yeah, we're not gonna be doing that. If you're using the hydraulic press, inexperience can damage the piston by using the incorrect setup. But 
Not all piston pins are press fit. Some from the factory are full floating. These are just held in by two circlips or two snap rings. Once you remove those, you can push the pin out with your finger. The hardest part of the job is making sure the snap ring doesn't go flying across the room. So at first, removing and installing piston pins might seem difficult, but if the piston pin is full floating, then you shouldn't have any issues. So, what can happen if the forward markings on the piston are installed backwards? What can happen if the connecting rod is slightly bent? And that's it. Studying for the A1 was extremely fun. It was very hands-on. Before you tackle the A1, I suggest you pass the A6 and the A8. That's automotive electrical and engine performance. You're gonna see many questions from those two tests on the A1. You're gonna see many repeat questions and that increases your chances of passing. So if you're gonna take the test soon, good luck, get your certifications, get your money up, have a good day.